Scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 and 29 through 32. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Heather. <clears throat> there we go. Oh, we don't want to go up. All right. I'm going over here then. Okay. Good morning again, and welcome to Redeemer Lincoln Square. Thank you, Heather, for reading for us. We decided a couple weeks ago to start a mini-series looking at relearning communal habits. And we decided to do this because, one, the pandemic has thinned out all of our relationships. Two, because the data shows that as a society, as a culture, we're more lonely than ever before. Three, because of our surveys that we gave you, some of you, well, actually, the majority of you on these surveys said that most of you have less than five friends here at Redeemer Lincoln Square. But we have a major problem. And the major problem is this. There seems to be something about the human condition that if you just put yourself with other people and spend time together, you will hurt each other. Everybody does this. I don't care if it's, a, if it's between you and your sibling. I don't know if, if it's between your parent and a child, between a friend and a friend. Just give it some time, and you will either hurt them, or they will hurt you, or more likely, it'll happen both ways. You can bank on it, which means unless we have a robust system of conflict resolution, I would actually argue that me standing up here calling people to do community is going to end up in a disaster. It's not going to work. And so the question we need to ask this morning is this, what do we do about that? What's the answer? And Paul in this text says there is an answer, but it's a secret in some respects. That the secret to being in community is the same thing that's the secret to being unified here in verse 3 that he talks about. But I would also argue it's the secret to the power that Christianity is going to be able to have to, to witness out in the world for the next 50 years. And that secret is being a place of forgiveness. I believe it's also the secret to good marriages. I believe it's the secret to good friendships. I believe it's the secret to relationships in general. But it's so important if we're going to have real community to have this, because if you don't, it's going to be impossible. We can't even begin. We can't even start. And, I, and I'm, gonna, I'm here to prove this to you. So let's do this in three parts. Let's look at the need for forgiveness. Let's look at the nature of forgiveness. And then let's look at the secret of forgiveness. We're going to look at the need, the nature, and the secret. So first, the need for forgiveness. Look, look at verse 3 here, right? Paul talks about how he's urging you in verse 1 to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. And as individuals, we try to read that individualistically, like, oh, okay, I got to live uh, that's worthy. But the next thing he says, after this nice list of being humble and gentle and patient and kind and, and long-suffering, this bearing up one another is long-suffering, is he says, make every effort to keep the unity— now, I don't know about you, but when somebody says you need to make every effort to do something, it means that there's times when you don't make every effort to do something. I, when I was, um, we were talking about high school just now with our, our youth, and when I was in high school, I was part of a soccer team, and I, when my coach would come over to our team to encourage us 
to make every effort to actually play hard on the field, the reason why he would do that is because we weren't making every effort. And so when Paul says this phrase, make every effort to keep the unity, what this is telling us is that it's actually difficult to do so, to stay unified. Why? Because the moment we feel hurt, the moment we feel betrayed, the moment that we feel wronged, that is the moment when we don't want to be unified. Later on, if you look down in verse 29, Paul says, uh, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And I think every uh, individual who reads that and thinks that Paul's just talking about cussing or cursing, uh, that's, that's way too myopic because that's not what Paul is talking about at all. The word unwholesome here is the word putrid, or it's, it's actually a very vivid image of rotting garbage. And what he's trying to say is that the reason why he, you should not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth is that when we feel so hurt and so wrong and so betrayed by somebody else, when we feel rejected, that is the moment that we're most likely to say something unwholesome about somebody else, not just out in the world, but actually inside our hearts. And this is something that you know if you lived in New York long enough about rotting garbage on a, on a summer night in New York City, that rotting garbage doesn't just stay in and of itself. The odor taints and colors everything else around you. That's the image that Paul is trying to say, is that it just doesn't just stay in one part of your heart. It gets into all the other aspects. And he doesn't just stay there, just don't let it, it look what it, it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but that conjunction is now what you should do, only what is helpful for building others up. Hmm. Paul's saying if you want unity, if you want community, which <laughs> unity is inside of community, if you want that, then you can't be tearing people down. You're supposed to be building them up. And by the way, what, how, what does building them up look like? Well, he gives us the opposite in verse 31. It, it, you don't want to skip over to verse 30. Verse 30 needs its own sermon because this concept of grieving the Holy Spirit is such a huge idea that actually the third member of the Trinity is hurt, is grieved when we're tearing people down. But what does that look like in verse 31? It's, it's bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, every form of malice. I'm not going to do a deep dive into each one of those words because I'm just going to assume that you know what those words are like. Because all we have to do is look at our culture, right? Bitterness, division, breaking up. And I'm not just talking politically. What we're watching in slow motion on a societal level but on an individual level is individuals and people and institutions dividing out because of bitterness. Rage and anger, have you been on the internet recently? <laughs> Malice, uh, I mean, it's, malice is ill will towards others. Uh, I'm, I'm actually part of a, a cohort with fellow pastors who I meet up with once a year, and I love these other pastors. It's, it's a beautiful thing, our relationship. We get to pray together. We get to cry together. We get to laugh together. But it's been interesting in all of our churches, when you come together, you start comparing and contrasting notes in everybody's church. Over the past two years, the report I've heard is that there has been, to some degree, an exodus from these churches of individuals who have left not because of a scandal, not because of doctrinal issues, not because of even theological issues. The report has been, almost every time, it's because of rage and anger about politics or protocols in regards to the pandemic. You were too political over here, I'm out. You were not political enough, I'm out. You talked about COVID and the pandemic and health and safety too much. You didn't talk about it enough. You didn't protect my family, you didn't protect me. And because of that, there's been this division. Community, friends, is hard. But unless we have a process of working through our differences to stay together despite the hurt, there will be no unity. Uh, novelist Frederick Buechner, who recently died just this past week at the age of 96, he said this. It's a, it's a great quote. He says, of the seven deadly sins, 
Anger is the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances, to roll over your tongue at the prospect of bitter confrontations to come, to savor the last twosome morsel of the pain that you're going to give them back. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that when you're wolfing down at the feast, it's yourself. The skeleton of the feast is you. And what he's getting at is this. He goes, it is good, it feels good to feast on, to consume somebody else than it is to forgive. And I would argue, a lot of you here don't feel like this is a problem. I would, uh, very few of you would say, hey, top three issue that I have is an unforgiving heart. And yet, which is so ironic, because you look at a culture which we're all part of, and it's falling apart. It's, it's dividing out. There's a book by uh, Christian Smith that, if I could summarize it, he says the average individual in this book uh, is uh, pessimistic about the world, but optimistic about themselves, which I think is hilarious. Because the world, we're in the world. Everybody is like, oh, it's messed up out there, but I'm okay. <laughs> Wait a second, that should be telling you something. There's a problem here. And the problem is this, is that we can talk about community all day long, but without forgiveness, without this ability, we might as well just give up now because I'll just tell you right now, if you're new to this church, I'm so glad that you're here, but stick around long enough and either I will hurt you or somebody else will hurt you or you will hurt them and you'll want to leave, and I'll want to leave, and we'll just divide because we, we just don't want to take it anymore. What's going to stop that endless dividing? We're not just talking about out in culture. We're talking about right here, right now with us. I believe that there has never been a bigger time for this need. And, but I would even argue, forget just here. How are you going to perpetually live with anybody else in your life? That's the need. Okay, number one. Number two, what's the nature of of forgiveness. That's the need of forgiveness. What's the nature? Look at verse 32. And so Paul puts no bracket around this. He says, be kind and compassionate, forgiving each other. So if I can give you a simple definition of forgiveness, here it is. It means not to keep somebody liable for what they've done to you in the past. I'll say it again. A healthy, full orb definition, a simple one though, of forgiveness is to not keep somebody liable for what they've done in the past. And notice this. The guilt of the other individual is not in question. The offense is not in question. There is real offense. There is real hurt. This really did happen. That's a fact that you've been wronged. But forgiveness is the regular act to withhold, to not extract payment from the individual for that fact. Even if you have the right to that payment, even if the world that maybe comes around you and says, by the way, you're right, you're in the right, you deserve, you should, it's saying you don't owe me, and even if you don't realize what you've done, even if you never realize what you've done, I'm not going to ask for it back. Little side point here, this is where people get a little confused. They think justice and forgiveness are at odds with each other. That's why people don't understand how to hold these together, but that's because we, we've made a, a false dichotomy here. Forgiveness is saying, I don't need back what you stole from me for me so that I'm whole again. That's what forgiveness is saying. I don't need that back. Justice is desiring and seeking shalom, put togetherness, wholeness for everyone. The perpetrator and the perpetrated. It's for everyone. So they're, they're not the same thing. Malice in Paul, right here, is working for the ill will. Forgiveness keeps you from that malice. And I would even argue forgiveness, in Paul's mind, means you have to, at some level, real forgiveness, you have to be open for a renewed relationship. That there's a possibility after restoration or, re or at least reconciliation that you could have that. And you say, where is that? Well, if unwholesome talk tears people down, but in verse 29, we're supposed to build people up, what does it mean to build people up? What do, they, what do people need? Go back to Genesis 1. People are made in God's image. God's image is three persons. That means you're made for community. You were built for community. You know what people need? They need you. And no, we're not supposed to wait until they recognize their need. No, we're not supposed to wait until they recognize what they've done or they've apologized. Paul doesn't say that. The, the great Chinese teacher, Watchman Nee, has this true story about a brother of his in uh, South China. Years ago, he had a, a rice field that was on top of a, of a hill. 
and these are staggered uh, uh, plots of land. And you would have to keep your rice field f wet, right? So you would have to, back then you had to hand pump the water up the hill to keep your rice field watered. But he had a neighbor, this individual had a neighbor that was below him that would poke holes in the divide between the two pieces of land and so that the water would drain from this individual's field down to his neighbors. He was basically stealing the water, stealing the work. And he did this over and over and over again. And so this individual asked some of his friends who happened to be Christians, what should I do about this neighbor? For me, I would have called the authorities or I would have, uh, I would have definitely tried to shame this individual or confront them or talk bad about them. But his friend said, you know what, try this. Why don't you try watering both fields? Water both fields, see what happens. And so he painstakingly was hand pumping for hours extra both fields. Eventually, the neighbor came over and said, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Which is fascinating because you would think you'd have shame for being caught or, or confronted, but being confronted with this kindness, with this compassion, it didn't compute. And by the way, if this feels foreign for you too, the, re the reason why it feels foreign is because it is. We don't do this in culture because this is hard. Why? Because when you've been really, really, really hurt, the pain doesn't just go away, doesn't evaporate. I don't know where this idea that forgiveness is easy, oh, I can just forgive you. I don't know where that comes from. Because for, for me, and I know for you, you have to exert effort every time. You have to make a decision to not hold so, what they've done against them, where you have to say, where you would want to say in your head, how could you? How dare you? And nurture that grievance the hardest thing to do is to not do that. Why? Because every injury is a wound. It's a deficit. There's a hole. And in that wound, when it festers, that's where the bitterness and the hurt and the rage and the anger and the malice comes from that Paul's talking about. And yet he makes no concession here. I promise you, there is no caveat. There is no like, well, if they feel up to it, oh, if they really show their repentance, oh, if they really want to. No, you don't see that. And I would argue the reason why we sit around and we say, oh man, I wish I had real relationship, real friendships, is because we don't know how to do this and we don't forgive one another. Now, um, some of you have been sitting here this whole time with like this like danger, danger, red flashing light in your head going, but what about abuse? But what about toxic people? What about harm? And I've said in, in past sermons we needed to talk about this. And I'm glad, I'm glad, this is important to talk about. So let me try to be clear. Number one, exploitation is never okay. I like using the word exploitation better than the word abuse. I'll tell you in a second. But exploitation is never okay. Paul is not telling you that if you are being exploited to, to stay in that relationship because it is not loving to that person to allow yourself to keep being exploited in that situation. Full stop, not okay. Whatever Paul is talking to us about, that's not what he's talking about. I also need to say here, and it probably hasn't been said enough in churches, people have used this, this very passage and the term to forgive as a form of holding power over somebody else to keep them down, to, to manipulate them, to use them. That's what's so dirty and evil about uh, e e even the right view can wield it in the wrong way can be oppressive and hurtful and exploitive. So we have to acknowledge that that's true and that's wrong as well. That being said, I think we need to become more careful with our words because I've been seeing people use this word abuse lexically in larger and larger situations. I've, I, just this past week, I saw somebody on the internet say, if you ask somebody to be a Christian, that's abusive. Because asking them to be a Christian, you're asking them to change their identity. That's not fair. That's not okay. That's abusive. And the problem when you start doing things like that is now you're, start, you're using these words rhetorically to clobber people. They're sort of like Trump words that you can use. Toxicity and gaslighting and, and abuse. Why is that problematic? Because what happens is, is people wise up and they go, huh, well, if you're going to call me abusive, guess what? It's abusive for you to call me abusive. You say I'm gaslighting, guess what? You're gaslighting me saying that I'm gaslighting you. And when, you, when people start doing that, now all of a sudden these words lose their, 
strength, and power. And you can easily flip these words. And that's highly problematic. Why? For two reasons. One, when we start labeling hard situations and just hard relationships and just the normal everyday conflict that we as people running up and rubbing up against each other do, then we're going to fail to stay in situations that Paul is calling us to. We're going to fail to long suffer. Do we even know what that means anymore? We're going to fail to know what it's like to have patience and perseverance. A. Right? This is the problem, is that when we start calling everything this, then we actually are going to fail to be in situations we're supposed to stay in. A. B. The other problem is, it cheapens the word and, and hurts people who actually really are being abused. It cheapens it and actually, it needs to and should be applied to really and truly abusive situations. And so here's my question. What do we do about this? If power exploitation is real, and you can do it in all different ways, either using these words and weaponizing them, or even using the phrase to forgive, you should forgive, you can still be abusive and and, uh, exploit people with that. And yet at the same time, using these labels improperly, dare I say, and ironically, is abusive too. (laughs) How can we really forgive people in this context? See, if this is real, and at the same time we're getting out of relationships that we probably should stay in, how do we stay? Last point, the secret to forgiveness. Like most secrets, I think it's hidden, it's buried. And typical Paul, it's, it's inside a phrase that you normally wouldn't expect. Look, go back to verse 1. Most people just zoom right on by. He says this, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, I... See, most of you go, I, you know, what does that mean? Why is Paul telling us that he's a prisoner? Does, is he trying to earn brownie points? Is he trying to just make us feel bad for his situation, that at the moment when he's writing this, he's imprisoned? No, I think the, the fact is he's trying to make a theological point. He's about to, the next phrase, he's going to ask us to do what I consider one of the hardest things to do, which is to stay in relationships, to be unified, to forgive And his point is, you can only do that if you have a change in how you think and how you wield power. Because the truth is this, prisoners don't have power. They're in prison. They they lack that power. And so Paul isn't in prison for his health. He's not just there for fun. Paul says, I'm imprisoned for the Lord. He's making an equation to his identity. He's saying, in other words, the only way that he knows that you won't exploit power, that you will actually forgive other people, is if your identity is in the Lord, who is a person whose very nature is about giving up power. But the, and this is the secret. The secret of forgiveness is at the core of the universe, the very center of reality, is a God who used his power to serve and to save others. So now, when we forgive somebody— this is important. We're not, we're, we're, here's what we're not saying. We're not saying this event didn't happen. We're not saying this didn't hurt me. We're not saying this doesn't actually affect me. We're not saying no harm, no foul. What are we saying? This, the story of Joseph th- this past week has, has ministered to me. Because look at Joseph's life. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was left for dead. I mean, think of the betrayal. And the, back in a time when people were close-knit. He was sold to slavery, imprisoned for wrongful accusations. Potiphar's wife, he did this to me. Truth was, that's not actually true at all. But he's in prison. He doesn't know when he's going to get out. When he finally does get out, he finally gets to a place of power. He's confronted with his brothers, and what does he do? Is his reaction, you did this to me, I'm going to do it to you. Is his reaction, I, you hated me to my core, so I'm going to hate you to, to, in my, to you back. No, somehow, and I don't know how he did this, but somehow he was able to say, I'm not going to do to you what you did, did to me. I'm not going to think or act or do what you did. And I want to know how he did that. And by the way, he was a person in power at this time. How did he do that? Somehow, Joseph had to have some sort of vague understanding and conception that God forgave him. And he did. 
Because of his faith, he knew that God was a God who would come and redeem his people. And so now when you forgive, what you're, here's what you're saying. I'm going to only treat you the way God treated me. And how did God treat Joseph? Forgave him and, so, and resin, remembered his sins no more. That doesn't mean that did, that injury didn't happen. That doesn't mean that, that there's not lasting effect here. But I'm going to change how I deal with you. And if Joseph could do that with, with a general understanding of God, what possibility might we have with a deeper understanding of how God did that for us in the person of Jesus, who specifically and fully and completely came for you? I say this a lot here, but I, the reason why is this, is this is where I get moved. If the center of Christianity is a man who dies for his enemies— whose hands are nailed open for his enemies, and you place him at the center of your life, the way you know that you really believe this is that's actually how you now start living your life too. Is your hands are nailed open to your enemies, to the people who injure you, to hurt you, and want you dead, and have left you for dead. Who left him for dead? And it is not too big for you. That is what this last verse, verse 32, means. When, when it says, forgive, why? Just as Christ God forgave you. Paul's saying that's the secret. The only way that he knows for us to stay unified, to be together, is, the, is letting this unconditional love seek into us where it changes us into people who become humble and patient and gentle and long-suffering. That's the only thing that's going to keep us from dividing out. In fact, to the degree that you're going to be able to stay in that community group when you get offended, and to the degree that you're going to be able to stay in that friendship that really hurts you, it's going to be to the degree that you realize that he's forgiven you first. And this is where I want to dream together, friends, as, as, as a church that's, that's restarting after the pandemic with a lot of new people. What if this was a place of forgiveness? What if this was a place where we would hurt each other, but we would stay? We would still talk to each other. We would maybe even we would need to confront and have conflict and work through it, but it would be in a context where we want to be together still. I was recently thinking about this for myself. I was like, man, I, you know what, when people need, I, there's some people in my life, I wish they would really just hear this passage and hear what this is saying. And I realized, wait a second, I'm only saying that because I haven't really forgiven them. I've just, I've rewielded the truth to hurt and injure and make myself feel better. I rewatched uh, season two of Ted Lasso, which is interesting because you know, season one, everybody's happy, but season two, there's all this sort of backstory of the characters, and there's this character named Roy Kent who is gruff, and this veteran soccer player who is curses a lot, which I don't condone. But in this second season, the first season, he's just mad all the time at everybody else. Here's the thing about anger. You can only stay angry at somebody if you feel justified, if you know that they're the problem. But what happens is in season two, he starts realizing He's the problem. And when he realizes he's the problem, he actually, it starts disempowering his, his ability to be as angry at everybody else. And that's the same for us. It's when we realize that first God had to forgive us, it slows our role. It changes our reality. So when things are done for us, it becomes the fuel and power to move back out into the world. Notice Paul's not saying here, forgive you know, God will forgive you if you forgive. He's not saying God's going to forgive you because you've forgiven. He's saying you've—it's in the past tense, isn't it? Be kind and compassionate, forgiving each other, just as Christ already has forgiven you. So what Paul is saying is, if, ironically, the test to know if you believe in Jesus, the way if you don't forgive, it's possible you don't see that Christ has already forgiven you. That's why on the cross, what does Jesus say? In some of his dying breaths, he says what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I guess I've, I've, I've been convicted this week, because I'm not sure that's actually on the tip of my lips about all my interactions. I don't, I don't feel that I have the same ability to do that. And I wonder, do I see what he, when he's saying that, is he saying that to me on my behalf? This world doesn't do this, which is why, friends, if this church did this, this is where the power is for the next 50 years. I, I, I just real quickly about my own personal story. I actually grew up in a Christian home. I would argue that I had brilliant parents, a mother and a father, who articulated Christianity 
really, really well. And it didn't stop me from leaving Christianity. It's not that the power wasn't in, if you could just perfectly present it, then you'll be changed. I walked away. And the only reason why I was able to come back is because as I evaluated myself inside the world, I saw that in my family and in the church, people who were deeply, deeply wounded by each other stayed together. And I said, there's something there. There's something that I want that I can't get out there. And I came back. Friends, you are loved, so forgive. Don't forgive to be loved. You're already loved. You've been forgiven. That's why we can forgive. You might not think this is your problem, but I, I promise you it's the reason why is because you've already divided yourself out. If you stayed a little bit, it was good. it's going to hurt. But there's so much possible if we do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, This is the plague that's upon us right now. It's, and it's in our culture. It's in our hearts. It's, I don't, I can't even. It's that, it's that emotional moment of saying, I, I don't want to, I, I just need to zone out. I just need to forget because it hurts too much. And yet you didn't say that about us. You didn't say, you know what, forget this, snap my fingers, start all over. It was worth it to you to say, I forgive them. I don't understand that love, but I know that love's been applied to us. I pray that we can turn around and do it to others. Whoever they might be in our lives, we pray these things in your name. Amen.